Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and welcome to the 17th annual CLGS Johnny Boswell Lecture here at Pacific School of Religion. My name is Bernie Schlager, I use he, they pronouns, and I serve as executive director here at the center. Please join me in welcoming this year's lecturer, Professor Luis Menendez Antunia, who will be speaking on why do biblical interpreters hate sex so much? And if we had an award for best titles in either of our lecture series, this would be at the top. Uh, welcome, Professor Menendez Antunia. We are honored by your presence with us. Before we begin, I'd like to share with everyone just some brief um, housekeeping details on the Zoom webinar. So let me share my screen here and say a few things. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, so today's lecture is being recorded, and this recording will be made available later on our website and our socials, including YouTube and Facebook pages. Um, while the Zoom chat, and I will try to enable it, it is supposed to be enabled today, uh, we will not capture the chat and the recording. Be mindful that the discussion here will be made available to a wider audience. Um, please feel free to share ideas and comments in the chat box once I open it, but we will use the Q&A feature for questions, uh, which Dr. Menendez Antunia will address at the conclusion of his lecture today. Uh, live transcript has been enabled, so just click on the show captions at the bottom of your screen, and uh, the captions will be provided uh, for you. And now I would like to introduce uh, uh, Professor David Vasquez-Levy, president of Pacific School of Religion, the home of the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies in Religion, uh, to welcome our speaker. Thank you, Bernie, and good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to be with you all this evening. And as Bernie said, perhaps if you are in farther west of us, it's a little earlier or east, a little bit later, including for our speaker today, it is great to have Dr. Luis Menendez Antunia with us. I am delighted to welcome you in a way back uh, here to PSR, the GTU, uh, and to have you in our community again in this way uh, for the presentation today. Again, my name is David Vasquez Levy. My pronouns are he, him, L, and I serve as president here at PSR. As I uh, was really piqued by uh, interested in the topic that uh, Dr. Menendez Antunia will address today. The image that came to mind for you, for me, was a movie that some of you may have seen, Keeping the Faith. And if you haven't, I'd encourage you to see it. It's a bit of a parable of sorts. It's a comedy uh, that takes place in a fairly conservative high school. And there's a scene in which one of the characters uh, is uh, corralled by a group of faithful Christians who are trying to convert her from her ways. And if she takes the Bible, throws it back at them and says, this is not a weapon, you idiot. Uh, so it's quite crass, a great show to watch. I recommend it. But I think it really captures the significance of today's conversation, provocative the as the title it is, that we are living through a time where I do think that uh, LGBTQ rights uh, are being wielded as a political and religious cudgel, uh, threatening the lives splitting the communities apart, and undermining decades of progress. The work of PSR Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies and Religion is crucial to transforming attitudes towards LGBTQ plus people within faith communities and society. And it is particularly effective in its work, both because CLGS is formed and led by communities most directly affected. And it also seeks to sit at an intersectionality of both race, gender, religion, identity, sexuality, and in a way to understand that it is on those complex spaces of identity that our theology must be now made as we enter and engage a much more complex world. The work we do as uh, welcoming communities, as uh, daring, queering theologians, as activists in the world, has always been critically important, but I do believe that there are ways in which this moment we are living through uh, requires that we stand up with courage and with pride to seek to transform the world, that together we may create a world where all can thrive. Thank you for joining us tonight. 
Thank you, President Vasquez Levy. And now I will introduce more fully our speaker for today's lecture. Uh, Luis Menendez Antunia is Assistant Professor of New Testament at Boston University School of Theology. He is interested in liberation theologies, cultural studies, and critical theory. Previously, he was Assistant Professor at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary and served as core doctoral faculty at the Graduate Theological Union here in Berkeley. Uh, Lewis's current research explores the queer and post-colonial afterlives of biblical text. He has published widely in several journals, including Estudios Ecclesiasticos, Biblical Interpretation, and the Journal of the American Academy of Religion. Lewis's first monograph, Revelation, Thinking Sex with the Great Whore, Deviant Sexualities and Empire, in the Book of Revelation, was published in 2020 by Rutledge, and the book offers a liberatory reading of Revelation 17 and 18 using post-colonial and queer historiographies to explore emancipatory paths for identity formation in biblical text. Lewis is currently working on a second monograph. I think he's just finished it, uh, just finished it, and it focuses on theoretical and hermeneutical developments in New Testament studies. Before completing his doctoral studies at Vanderbilt University, uh, Lewis received a Master in Biblical Studies from the Universidad Pontificia Comillas and a Master of Theology from the Universidad Pontificia Salamanca. Uh, he is a Fulbright Scholar and has received many grants, including grants from the Hispanic Theological Initiative, the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning in Theology and Religion, and the Louisville Institute. Lewis also received the Diamond Award for Integrative Scholarship for his work on torture in the Gospel of Mark. Lewis also brings to his work 12 years of activism and ministry experience. He has worked in community organizing, HIV advocacy, homeless shelters, prison, and with children on the streets. His political and theological commitments spring from his involvement in Catholic Christian-based communities rooted in Latin American liberation theologies. And finally, before Lewis begins, let me say just a few words about this uh, lectureship here at CLGS. The CLGS John E. Boswell Lecture is an endowed lectureship established here at the center in 2007 with the aim of bringing leading scholars in religion, spirituality, sacred text studies, gender and sexuality studies to the PSR campus, or in this case, to the PSR Zoom room. What inspired us here at the center to name our annual spring lecture series after John Boswell was in great part his willingness to take risks in his own scholarship and activism and face those, and there were many, who criticized or even dismissed his work largely because he chose to write about topics that many believed were best left not discussed, something best left in the closet. That is the histories of queer peoples and religion and spirituality. Over the years, we have welcomed scholars, religious and spiritual leaders, change-making activists and artists to this lectureship and what has characterized each Boswell lecturer is their commitment to take risks in their religious leadership, scholarship, activism, and art to help shape a world that, in the words of the center's mission statement, a world that advances the well being of lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, and transgender people, and transform faith communities and the wider society by taking a leading role in shaping a new and progressive public discourse on religion gender identity and sexuality through education, research, community building, and advocacy. And now with our introductory comments concluded, I'm pleased to welcome once again, Lewis as our 17th annual CLGS John E. Boswell lecturer speaking today on why do biblical interpreters hate sex so much? Lewis. Thank you so much, Bernie, for a generous introduction. And thank you, David, for hosting us. Um, it's truly an honor to be invited to deliver the 17th annual lecture. And beyond formalities, I say this in a very emotional way. A few years ago, as a queer young adult studying theology in Spain, in rather conservative settings, I started to do some research online about places that hosted and foster intellectual, religious, and theological encounters between faith and queerness. The Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies in Religion was one of the first places that popped up. I remember looking at the webpage in awe, 
who would have thought I recall experiencing that my gayest intellectual dreams had a place in the world. I applied for the PhD program at the GTU precisely because a place like the center was in the picture. I got admitted, but I needed to balance other considerations, so I ended up pursuing a PhD at Vanderbilt. It was the, the right decision back then, but I have always remained grateful for, for the center and the place that offers to, the, to queer thriving. I'm grateful for what the center does and the windows it opens for many of us invested in a world that brings together faith and queerness. It is beautiful that exists an institution advancing the well-being of lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, and transgender people in the context of what traditionally has been alienating spaces. I'm humbled to have been invited to a place that has done so much to turn alienation into flourishing. I have divided this lecture into three parts. The first part is called the narrative and presents the terms in which contemporary biblical interpreters think and talk about sex. Part two is called the theory and suggests ways in which queer theory may help us reframe how such conversations happen. And part three, the biblical, reflects on what all interpreters, gay and straight, may learn from queer theory concerning the issue of sex. The narrative. The question posed in the title, why do biblical interpreters hate sex so much, seems to assume that biblical interpreters hate sex and that they hate it a lot. The question may also imply that biblical interpreters and by extension other theological practitioners are unique in their hate of sex. On the other side of the hatred, one would think, stands the secular world and its celebration of sex, sexuality, and the myriad ways in which new identities have come to be. Given Western culture over sexualization of every dimension of human life, it looks like everyone loves sex. The renaissance of the religious right on public platform, platforms has widened the culturally perceived gap between the seeming hatred of sex by Christians and the love for it professed by those with no explicit faith commitments. And here, bridging the gap, are some of us trying to ensure that our faith remains queer friendly, invested in the linking queer identity from theological alienations, and committed to envisioning a future where faith communities stop being toxic to our thriving. And to our luck, the reality is that progressive theologies have made enormous progress in this regard. Within progressive circles, LGBTQIQQ plus identities have come to stand for sex and gender. So affirming inclusive policies, theologies and interpretations has had the effect of redeeming sex from moralizing associations and expanding the category of gender from, an initially, from its initially restrictive binary exclusion. The result will be something like this. We know that traditionally the Bible has stood in opposition to sex, but we are here to remind Christians and non-Christians that the Bible is inclusive and that our faith is not sex averse. To the contrary, we welcome and affirm all sexual identities. In this narrative, progressive interpreters turn hate into love because they depart from previously condemning visions of sexual diversity and embrace a new ethos of inclusion. What other underlying cultural dynamics sustain this narrative of hate and love for sex? For sure, the factors explaining why biblical interpreters hate sex while the public loves it are numerous and beyond the scope of the lecture, and to be honest, beyond the scope of my expertise. But let me adventure a tentative, rather primary and overreaching rationale. Biblical interpreters hate sex, one may think, because of the church's age all war against sex, or the church's impossibility to think of healthy sexual arrangements outside heterosexual monogamous marriage. Citizens in the West love sex because the feminist and sexual revolution has the linked 
sexual norms from their pre-given theological and moral grounding, initiating a new cultural momentum open to experimentation and freedom. For reasons of context, the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies in Religion sits at the forefront of progressive politics, and I align with these values. My contribution this evening does not focus on the part where traditional approaches hate sex. I'm more concerned with preaching to the choir, to my choir. It is unlikely, after all, that fundamentalist evangelicals will be listening to this lecture. The choir here is then progressive interpreters who have come to think of themselves as loving sex. My claim on this front is a pretty simple one. Despite what we tell ourselves about the salvific, nurturing, and healthy components of sex, we have also come to hate sex. And there are good reasons and bad reasons why we should continue to hate it. A couple of clarifications on this front. When I say that traditional approaches hate sex, I mean that sex is contained within a strictly regulated boundaries. Since I identify as a Catholic, an example will be how Catholicism confines sex within the terms of a heterosexual committed marriage with the strict norms about contraception. I also realize that progressive is a buzzword and it has turned out to be an empty signifier over the years. Progressive here today refers to those traditions, churches, seminaries, divinity schools, as subcultures within the traditional circles that have included LGBTQ plus people as legitimate partners in their constitutions. Queer sexuality, whether we like it or not, and many of us have come to like it, has become a litmus test to identify how different traditions talk about sex and sexuality and where they fall on the spectrum between regressive and progressive policies. In biblical studies, which is my disciplinary field, queer approaches are both a reflection and a contributing factor to the acceptance of, of queer sexuality. Recent developments in biblical studies have contributed to a de-estigmatization de of sex, fostering a redemptive vision of sex friendlier to the plight of sexual minorities and devoid of traditional moralizing language. Queer theory has made considerable progress in the curriculum. Furthermore, feminist, womanist, and mujerista interpretations and their respective positions on gender and sex have successfully become constitutive elements of the progressive theologi theological curriculum at a good number of progressive seminaries and divinity schools. <clears throat> Excuse me. Considering these developments, would it be fair to say a biblical interpreter's hex hate sex a bit less, or even that they have come to love sex. In such inst institutional contexts, nobody really hates sex, if by that statement we mean the general disposition of condemning sexual minorities and regarding queer sexuality as mor morally deplorable. Believers, theologians, pra theologians, practitioners, and biblical scholars in this still minoritarian tradition would balk at the accusation that they hate sex. The rebuke will be something like, but we welcome and affirm all sexual identities. I'm not contesting such claim. I have benefited enormously from this progress. It would be inconceivable just a few years back that I could hold my current teaching position doing research on sex and the Bible within a queer framework. I'm suggesting, however, that this narrative of progress remains too enmeshed in the oppressive networks that gave birth to it, and that one way out of the tight gridlock, not the only path, but a productive one, calls for a revisiting of the core contributions of queer theory. More specifically, I'm advocating for retracing queer theories insights about the contentious and conflictual relationship between sex and identity as a way to step out of dominant theological frameworks that insist on talking about sex, queer sex, in terms of inclusion and exclusion. 
queer interpretation of scriptures have illuminated the complicated ways in which ancient notions of sex and gender remain alien to how we have come to understand sexuality in the present. Queer interpretations of scripture have also contributed to a much better understanding of how biblical sex remains entangled with discourses of male superiority or ethnic exclusivity. A welcome outcome of these contributions is that they allow contemporary biblical interpreters to discern what type of relationship they want to establish with a past that remains culturally other. Versus traditional biblical interpretations that draw facile parallels between sex in the past and the present, queer theory has built a thicker wall containing the toxic spills of the biblical past into the present. We can only conceive of a healthy sexual present, as this narrative goes, if we sever our ties with the patriarchal, colonialist, and ableist underpinnings of the sexual past. How does revisiting queer theory illuminate this narrative? It complicates the notion of a healthy sexual present, as subsequently opens holes in the wall that progressive biblical interpretation has built to contain the biblical past. On this front, the argument is quite simple. The New Testament hates sex, and so do we. Everyone hates sex. The question then opens up, is that always a bad thing? Queer theory, let me be clear here that I'm not talking about queer theology, is an academic enterprise that has gained significant purchase in the field of literary studies. It's a complex subfield tightly linked to post-structuralism, deconstruction, feminist and gender studies, post-colonial critique, psychoanalysis, etc., and analyzes the mandarin connections between sex and power. What interests me here is queer studies reflection on sex and identity. Precisely, how sex constitutes an attack on identity and the kinds of complications that ensue from such assault. Instead of beating you up with a lot of queer jargon about queer studies, let me show you, uh, let me start with, with three anecdotes that show how queerness loves at identity. First anecdote. <clears throat> In one of her most burning cracks, Joan Rivers, commenting on Heidi Klum's red carpet look at one of Elton John's AIDS Foundation events, hit a brutal punchline. The host of Fashion Police, a show devoted to dissecting the best and worst dressed celebrities at social events, got into serious trouble for comments that the Anti-Defamation League termed as vulgar and offensive to Jews and Holocaust survivors. John Rivers' remarks on the supermodel's look are remarkably inappropriate. She said, the last time a German looked this hot was when they were pu pushing Jews into the ovens. Second anecdote. If one of RuPaul's drag race episodes, when Roxy Andrews, one of the contestants, landed in the bottom, she broke out in tears recalling one of the most traumatic events in her life. When asked about a seemingly disproportionate reaction, she shared how her mother abandoned her and her sister at the bus stop when she was a kid. Fast forward a couple of seasons in the show, Roxy Andrews shares the stage with Katya, another famous drag queen, in the reading challenge, where participants, queens as they are known in the queer world, throw shade at each other, picking on their flaws and poking fun at their failures. A few seasons later, Katya addressed her in the famous reading challenge. Roxy, I think of you every morning at the bus stop. Third example, on the cusp of the HIV crisis, deceased Paria News had signed a magazine devoted to publishing works by and addressing people with HIV regularly publish humor vignettes on the deadly disease. In one, we find an advertisement for AIDS Barbie's new Malibu Dream Hospice, with an image of a spotted Barbie 
lying on a hospital be bed. In one of the catchphrases we read, "H Barbie, compliment her on her slim, trim new figure. <coughs> the Holocaust, child abandonment, and the HIV pandemic are no doubt no laughable stock. You will notice, however, that your reaction has made you extremely uncomfortable, uneasy, and possibly offended, even as you struggle to put a laugh on your face. I will not try to contextualize this type of humor in terms of their authors, although authorship plays a significant role in allowing me to draw from these examples without discarding them. John Rivers, a gay icon in her own right, is a Jew herself with family ties with Holocaust victims. Roxy Andrews and Katia were not only friends, but had buy-in in the dynamics of reading. And the HIV magazine was produced by and addressed to gay men suffering the deadliest consequences of living with HIV. These anecdotes exemplify how queer culture has developed a way of performing humor that is inappropriate, campy, self-referential, and anti-identitarian in the sense that it turns upside down our most serious convictions about ourselves and others. The coda, don't take yourself too seriously, become, in queer parlance, laugh about everything that you hold dearly. Why is this humor placed in the context of identitarian politics and what does sex have to do with it? Far from reinforcing the walls of identity formation, this type of humor chips away at the dignity we try to carry ourselves around. This type of humor is demeaning to everyone, including oneself, materializing the queer notion that if you can laugh at yourself, nobody else can. The queer tradition of reading is the practice of criticizing each other based on a double entendre, laughing at every attempt of the ego to shore up its defenses in the face of attacks. Let me now dele delineate briefly how queer theory foregrounds this type of discussion. <clears throat> it all started with Foucault. In the History of Sexuality, Volume 1, Foucault argued against what had become a truism in the West, the repressive hypothesis. The repressive hypothesis understood that the relationship between power and sex had manifested over the past 300 years as repression. On the contrary, Foucault argued that discourses about sex increased in the form of institutional and state speech. Many aspects of the business of managing sex, marriage laws, discourses about children's sexuality, medicine, proliferated and became ingrained in our subjective identity. One effect of this proliferation of discourses about sex was the creation of what Foucault calls sexuality as a domain of the human experience. It is the birth of sexual identity as a certain as a centerpiece of how the West has come to understand itself. Foucault was highly critical of this discursive formation and more relevant to our purposes, demonstrated how in antiquity, Greco-Roman, um, the classic period, there was no such a thing as sexual identity. The relevant point here is that Foucault sought to excavate how Greco-Roman sources talked about sex, not to recuperate those sources, because the, among other things, they are male-centered and misogynistic, but as an exercise of imagination of how contemporary subjectivities could think of themselves outside of sexuality. For Foucault, the problem with identity is, an effect of the, is that it's an effect of the discourses of power. In one of his most famous quotes, Foucault argues that, and I quote, the rallying point for the counterattack against the deployment of sexuality ought not to be sex desire, but bodies and pleasures. Highly critical of psychoanalysis for providing the grounding for the pathologizing of sex, Foucault issues an invitation to think of ourselves beyond the sexual identities that have been imposed on us, be those identities gay, straight, or lesbian. Queer psychoanalysis, as it expected in a bitch fight, 
has not remained silent to this accusation. Leo Bersani in 1987, in his groundbreaking contribution, Is the Rectum a Grave, wrote at the peak of the AIDS crisis, a rejoinder to mainstream US culture, more concerned with drawing a prophylactic boundary around those dying than about caring for those who were ill. Bersani's quit wit matches his thoughtful analysis of sex. He says, there is a big secret about sex. Most people don't like it. It is a rich text, but I just mean to focus on a relevant insight. Penetrative sex epitomizes how sex produces a shattering of the ego. Despite and because of the negative stigma associated with the penetrated partner in a gay relationship with femininity, in an otherwise male-centered culture, being penetrated demonstrates to what extent sex complicates ego identifications that sustain identity. The shattering of the ego that occurs during sex is a reminder of how our strong convictions about who we are collapse in the face of relationality. This shattering of the ego means that the self has been promoted to the status of the ethical ideal and collapses momentarily for sure, but it still collapses during sex. The value of sexuality itself, Bersani concludes, is to demean the seriousness of efforts to redeem, to redeem it. In other words, sex is a grave matter because it laughs at our identities. This idea of powerlessness goes against what we have learned about agency, autonomy, personhood, subjectivity, self-respect, self-esteem, etc. Most people don't like sex, Bersani argues, because most people are concerned about walling up the boundaries that separate us from the rest. And sex chips away at those attempts. We may start to notice here how the highly inappropriate jokes readings mentioned above in the three anecdotes throw into relief how queerness works as an invitation to deconstruct aspects of our identity that we consider beyond the limits of humor. Queer thinking in this light sees sex as literalizing the undoing of identity, not as reifying it. Fast forward a few years, Tim Dim and Davis Oliver within this tradition of pitting sex against identity encapsulate the reason why sex is genuinely not love. <coughs> Excuse me. And I quote, Identity is one of the most powerful prophylactics through which sex is made safe. We argue to the contrary that sex is not harmless. It violates propriety and the appropriate, just as its excessive pleasures threaten the coherence of human egos and thereby challenge identity. Sexual pleasure is both longed for and hated because it disrupts disorders, renders deplorable, and sh shatters our dignity. Dean and Davis assume that identity relies on processes whereby the ego colonizes experience, and that sex, even at, as it is featured in progressive or radical agendas, is a reminder that the ego is an illusion and a narcissistic one at that. Madhavi Minon, for example, from an altogether geopolitical context, in her study of sexual subcultures in India, is equally impassionate about the colonizing of identity on subject formation. Rather than confining the potential infinite ways of our desire, desires work into established identities, she suggests flying with unrestricted desire disavowing culturally dominant attempts to discipline desire into identity. Desire in this reading goes against the strictures of identity, be them gay or straight. Foucault, Bersani, Tim Tim, Amenon, um, uh, among many others, 
epitomize a type of approach to sex that de delinks sexual acts from sexuality. Their proposals to center bodies and pleasures, self-shattering, abjection, or desire become antidotes against the strictures of identity. What I find illuminating in this queer take is their grappling with the fact that sex has an understand component. It is not all rainbows and unicorns. Sex has the potential to undo who we are. And in a culture of sex with obsessed with identity, with solidifying the features that define us, sex comes up as a force of destruction. That's why deep down, we all love to hate it. In this version of queer theory, sex exceeds, exceeds sexuality. Sex and thus sexuality in the sense that sexuality has become an essential component of how we identify in the West. But what about the biblical world? Historical approaches to the New Testament has, have long argued that Paul's stance on sex is intricated with his attempt at establishing clear community boundaries with the outside world. Regulating sex for Paul entails creating internal community rules. Don't have sex so you may focus on what is essential, as well as at external ones. Having sex with a prostitute, for example, pollutes the community. Sex, to continue with the framework that I'm presented so far, is inimical to communal identity. But this framework does something else. It doesn't let contemporary interpreters off the hook. <clears throat> to pose sex is despised for the antithetic, antithetical forces that throw the subject outside the boundaries of identity. In that case, there is a point of connection between the kenotic tradition in theology and the queer insight that we hate sex because of its ego destruction dynamics. It is not by chance that Bersani suggests a strong parallels between the figure of the mystic and the practitioner of anonymous sex. The first penetrated by God to the point of identity erasure, the second penetrated by X to the point of identity collapse. After all, anonymous sex is based in non-identities. Bersani writes, at the ideal limits of their as ascesis, both their individualities, the mystic and the anonymous sex practitioner, are overwhelmed by the massive anonymous presence to which they have surrendered themselves. What if then, following in these thoughts, we're inclined to advocate for less sexuality and more sex? This approach will involve a shift in how we think about both. Instead of expunging sex from its dirty secrets and subsuming it under categories of gender and sexuality, we may plunge into its depths as an exploration of what we resist to know about ourselves. In the context explored in the first part of the lecture, this alternative meets some roadblocks. We should consider the, the fear in progressive circles of going back to confessional stigmatizations of sex. Who will want to return to the moralization and scrutinization of every sexual de deviance? But just because we have an antiquary history, it doesn't mean we cannot be creative in the use we make of sex as an enemy of identity. How may we envision this framework in our reading of scripture? And how might it inform an interpretive, interpretative approach that is both queer affirming, self-negating, and scripturally responsible? Queer interpretation of scripture scrutinizes the biblical past for different purposes. To name a few as a place to make sophisticated moral reasoning, as an archive showing and hiding queer characters, as a document imbued in a set of cultural, social, historical, and theological aspects that inform its stances of sexuality, on sexuality, or as a test case to account for the historiographical gaps 
that separates that separate Western notions of sexuality from ancient ones. It is hard to overestimate the positive impact that these strategies continue to have among contemporary delegitimation, oppression, and erasure. Who would want to dispense with such life-giving and queer-affirming strategies? My critique signals, however, that by letting contemporary queer identities off the hook, they have let our adversaries determine the types of responses that are possible. Queer theory on this front invites us to continue scrutinizing the complications of presence identities, throwing into relief how identity and queer are oxymoronic terms. It's common practice to read the scripture for inspiration and deconstruction. A scriptural reading both comfort our spirit and challenge our assumptions. I find it interesting and theologically significant that we lack an intellectual and a spiritual tradition invested in questioning our present politics. Naturally, investing in building a world where we are not under attack means that we have to work to, do atta to attack what we have received as given knowledge. We find a similar dynamic a struggling, a struggling between inspiration and deconstruction in biblical texts. A specific New Testament texts reify re group identity in sync with surrounding moral norms. The domestic codes, for example, <clears throat> epitomize how the Christian ego is fashioned after imperial values. On the other hand, Paul's aversion to marriage sits on the opposite side of the scale because it conditions the sacrosanct value of ma marital relationships to the flourishing of communal identity. If the genealogy that I'm delineating here has any truth to it, one of the reasons why contemporary conservative approaches to scripture hate sex lies in the fact that sex and thus community formation. On the other side, progressive Christianity hates sex because it undoes what we have come to believe is essential to sexuality as an identitarian category. Just like evangelical culture has made Jesus a pinnacle of the nuclear family, LGBTQI-friendly approaches have made queerness a paragon of identity. Consider the following pericope. In Luke 14, 26, we read, and turning around, Jesus said to them, If any man comes to me and has not hate for his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and even for his life, he may not be my disciple. Jesus' injunction to the disciples to abandon their wives and husbands is a good example, not because it speaks to historical sectarian emphasis on cut, of cutting off ties with the surrounding environment in light of an apocalyptic vision of reality, but because it is a point in which the structures that support identity come under attack. My point is not so much that passages like this speak against cultural values. They do. They're also male-centered. Notice that the invitation is only issued to the male disciples and does not address how women will need to behave. So I'm not suggesting either that they have queer potential because they question the contemporary heterosexual family, which they do too. My suggestion is that they have queer potential because in the delicate balance between reinforcing the inheritance self and challenging it, they dramatically bet on the later. No wonder that the following verse mentions the cross as the condition of possibility for Christian formation. Family structures constitute the, bas the basis for identification and an incomparable source of identity formation. By removing these sustaining structures, Jesus grounds identity somewhere else. In this case, the hate for the family and the hate for sex stand in close parallel with the distinction that in the first case, hate for the family, the demand to hate one's relative 
is in the service of a new desire. Whereas the hate of sex is an invitation to explore its desubjectifying and ego destroying, destroying effects. In both cases, the result is the same. A departure from cultural demands on identity and an invitation to create a new type of relationality beyond culturally prescribed formations. This hermeneutical principle allows contemporary queer interpreters to cast a wider net about biblical genealogies. What constitutes a queer biblical canon and what texts we may see at work in deconstructing who we are. It, it, it also warns interpreters against their delusionary attempts to master the text. If the task of queer critique is to pursue anti-identitary informations, the text may no longer become a grounding element for identity. Queer hermeneutics accordingly invites us to recenter the inappropriacy of approaching a text in search of ego identifications. Now we can answer the initial question with a surprising turn of events. Why do biblical scholars hate sex so much? Because I suggest they should. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, we will now open the room or the Q&A box, I guess, to any questions or comments. So uh, please feel free to put your questions in there and I will uh, attempt to referee them. Uh, I have a couple that have come in uh, to me uh, via email. So if someone's watching on Facebook. Uh, so let me let me frame these. Here is one, and I will keep my eye on the Q and A. So again, if you have any questions or comments uh, for Lewis, please put them in the Q and A box, which should be working. Uh, here is one: uh, the Bible and other sacred writings uh, are often taken by many people to be, especially activists, anti-sex. One way to deal with this has been among progressive activists to dismiss biblical views on sex as patriarchal deadly for queer people and even irrelevant. And then they go on to say in the academy today, especially in the fields of Hebrew and Christian scripture study, how do you read the field in terms of exploring sex sexuality? I guess they're asking, what is the state of the field today? Um, and that's a big question. So, um, That's a, a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. <clears throat> Where do I, where, where I stand now, this is how I see the field concerning these issues. The first consideration I will say here is that the field is inherently historicist, meaning that the field considers the Bible as a historical document. So questions about queer sexuality remain on the margins of the field precisely because they are not or the scholars do not consider them, consider those type of questions as relevant to history. Within the field of queer biblical studies or queer theologies, if you will, um, there has been a lot of creativity in the last 20 years. And as I, I have shared with you in the lecture, uh, progress has, enormous progress have, has been made on this front uh, for different reasons. Um, I think, for example, one of the reasons is that the eruption of queer students uh, in divinity school has, has put pressure on, uh, on administrations and on hiring policies to diversify the type of scholars who teach um the scriptures and definitely I'm one case uh in, in, in on that on, on that front. I, I remember that when I, I interviewed for Boston University there was enormous pressure from students to to hire someone who was familiar with queer theory. And I think that happens has happened across across the nation. Um 
so although I'm very appreciative of how uh, the field has, has bought into queer th theology and queer theory, I do feel that uh, in general, and what I'm going to say is a general statement, but I, I stick by it. The moment queer theory enters religious studies or theology, it becomes domesticated. Because the questions of the questions about um, queer interpretation of, of the text have revolved so much about exclusion and inclusion for different for 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 different reasons, but one of them is that um, whether we like it or not, a biblical scholarship also has into consideration church politics, and church politics have framed the issue of queer, gay, lesbian, gender, sexuality around the issue of inclusion and exclusion, and I I think that enormous progress has has been made on that front. But my critique, particularly in this lecture, is that. Um, when we frame the issue in terms of inclusion and exclusion, we are framing the terms. Uh, we're framing our identity. We're framing our politics. Uh, in according to our enemies. And that might be necessary, but I am pushing to new strategies in which we do not frame the problem exclusively in response to but um, as a way of creating new ways of thinking about ourselves. And Thank also you. in terms of what the straights have to learn about the queer, from the queers. Thank you. Uh, this uh, question, a, a brief one was texted to me just now. Is there any uh, are there any biblical references, foundations, or reflections in scholarship today around the uh, increasingly popular contemporary identity of asexuality? Um, it, it's, can there be, uh, is, is there a biblical world that, that describes what we think of today uh, as uh, asexuality? I'm not very familiar with uh, asexuality, except that I was a monk for 10 years and I didn't have sex for 10 years. So, <laughs> so I had like a embodied experience of um, of that. But jokes aside, that's not being asexual. Asexual is like the lack of, if I understand it correctly, I've, I, although I'm not very knowledgeable about this topic, is the um, a gradual or absolute lack of um, sexual drive, if you will. As far as I know, there is not much research on this front in biblical in 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 biblical interpretation. Uh, only recently, uh, by recently I mean the last five ten years, um, biblical studies have moved from from male or female center sexuality, gay sexuality to transgender identities, and some progress has been made recently on that. But the issue of asexuality is not, um, to my knowledge, has not been explored very much. So I, I would um, encourage the, the person who asked this to go into PhD and, <laughs> and do this. There might be, a, a I mean, one of the reasons for that is uh, if, if my genealogy of the field is, is somewhat accurate, uh, I would think that queer scholars are hesitant to explore the issue of asexuality precisely because it would bring us back to a hermeneutics of no sex, right? So at the moment where sex has become a part of our discourse, it will seem it will seem counterproductive to explore uh, identities that are based on, on no sexual drive. Thank you. This next uh, question is from Sandy in the Q&A. Um, our churches follow the lectionary saying that this is a tradition whereby the church can read the Bible over three years. Why do you think that the lectionary excludes the Song of Songs? 
Um, I think the the question already has the answer in it. <laughs> um, I do like even progressive churches, at least in my experience, who who that that pay attention to the song of songs celebrate the erotic but not the sexual. So there is the 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 song of songs is a good example of how the Bible is very sexually explicit, but also it's a good example of how when that uh like is translated into the church, it becomes not sexual but erotic or um or based on identity, which is where my critique goes. So it's not only that the church does not include the Song of Songs because it's very sexually explicit, but when it does, it um, translate it, trans translates it into erotic categories and not sexual ones. Thank you. And this from TJ, a uh, fascinating way of framing the queer conversation around sexuality and exclusion versus sex. I love it. What do you think it would take to shift this conversation toward the latter emphasis? That's a great question. It's something I really, um, I'm really grateful for it because I have some thoughts about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the great, in general terms, uh, one of the beautiful things that, um, or one of the contributions that queer people have to offer to culture in general. But more specifically, to church in particular, is to talk about sex. Not about sexuality, but about sex. And that could translate into, for example, um, promoting sex education in the churches, which I think is a task that is very much needed. Mm -hmm. And on that front, I think um, queer people have sex in very different ways, in very creative ways that remain under the radar of uh, mainstream culture, that remain under the radar of definitely progressive church politics. And the contribution here is to keep pushing that underlying um, current of knowledge to the surface. There is, a, in my opinion, there is a lot of knowledge to be gained in theor theorizing the ways in which queer people experience sex. But not only for queer people, for straight people too. Thank you. And this from Barnabas. I really appreciate the issue you are surfacing and I can feel my mind clawing out of the rut you have identified. Could you help by giving another scriptural example and show how an undomesticated queer reading is better or helpful than an identity inclusion reading? Thank you so much. Sure. So I mentioned the lecture of the domain. <clears throat> To recap what I'm trying to argue here is the fact that um, the texts, the biblical texts that will count as help us to be more queer are those not are not definitely those texts that talk about sex or those texts that talk about sexual ethics. It could be any text in which the text is at odds with mainstream identity formation. So on this front, we could create kind of an, a spectrum, right? This text and thus identity, this text reinforces identity. But the thing is that identities are contextual, right? Like I'm not claiming here that I have a sense of what everybody experiences as their identity. Identities are contextual. Although in the West, we have come to understand identity in terms of homosexual or heterosexual, the possibilities of identity are 
exorbitant. There are many multiple possibilities. And what I'm arguing here is that those texts that whether in their own context or in our own context have potential to undo who we are and how we experience ourselves are queer friendly. So on that front, for example, I mentioned the domestic codes are definitely unqueer or queer unfriendly, not because they um, they order the submission of wives to the husbands or the slaves to the masters, although that needs to be exploration too, but this, they are unqueer because they adapt to mainstream Greco-Roman values. So in that sense, the addressee of the letter or of the domestic codes see, sees their identity reinforced. A good example of, um, on the other side of the spectrum, since the question um, asked for another example, would be, for example, Paul stands on marriage. This does not mean that I'm claiming that Paul is a queer friendly guy. That's not one of Paul's ethics is very much embedded in a patriarchal imperial ethos. But there are points, important points in um in Paul where he really is countercultural in the sense that goes against basic structures of identity. A marriage would be one. So what I'm claiming here is that Paul's stance on marriage in 1 Corinthians, for example, is queer friendly, not because it's against marriage, but because allow us to see a point in Christian formation where Christianity and thus identity. Definitely the ultimate in this approach, the ultimate texts uh, that will be queer friendly will be the texts of concerning the crucifixion. Just because they are the texts where it shows to what extent the main character, Jesus, speaks against the basic formations of identity to the point of death. Thank you. And I think we have time for two more questions and I have two more that have come in. Here is one. Um, and they say, one might think that some scholarship in contemporary biblical studies, especially since the appearance of critical historical methodology has in many ways contributed to queer liberation. Uh, given our current national and international move toward Christian nationalism, using the Bible to support white supremacy, et cetera. Is there any pushback in the American Academy of Religion Society of Biblical Literature to this liberative approach? In other words, are we seeing political uh, movements within these academic societies um, that are tracking more right and, and anti-sect in terms of Bible study and work? That's a great question. Uh, that's a great, a really great question. And I have, I'm going to respond to it obliquely because I don't fully agree with the terms of the question. Okay. So the question seems to assume that historical criticism, the, the, the rise of historical criticism in biblical studies has helped to um, the 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 destigmatization de of sex, and that's a fair statement. Hmm? But I do think <clears throat> that historicism or historical critical historical critical approaches are extremely limited in their ability to provide queers strategies for liberation. Because for the starters, the Bible is not just a historical document. The Bible is much more than a historical document. If it were an historical doc, just a historical document, we would be reading Aristotle and Plato along the Bible, and we are not. I mean, not to say that we are not, but like Aristotle and Plato are not preached every Sunday on uh, on the pulpit. That that's my point. 
And I think uh, although hist historical critical approaches have helped us to understand sex, sexuality, and gender in the context of the first century have not helped us at, at all in translating into what it means to read scripture in the present. So actually in the in the journal in the American Academy of Religion and in the SBL, what I see is not so much uh push against historicism, um, at least in the circles that I move, but a defense of historicism as the way to move forward. So the response will be something like this. They hate as people, like the conservatives hate queer people and the historians will respond, what we need is more history in order to address that hate. I do think that that strategy is necessary, but very short-sighted. And a final question, and this comes from someone listening on a phone, I think, because they sent it in WhatsApp. So um, I'm not asking you to predict the future or uh, speak for Jesus, but do you think there's a post-identitarian future out there? Uh, that's the first part of the question, if that's understandable. And then secondly, uh, do you think Jesus would be against the identities that we embrace today around gender and sexuality and queerness. So, <laughs> so it's not well, asking me only to like predict the future, it's actually <laughs> asking me to get into Jesus' mind. <laughs> yeah, two simple questions. Um, they're great questions too, though. Um, so concerning the first part of the question, uh, do we do can we envision a post identitarian future? I'm not sure, uh, but I what I'm sure is that queer people are very creative, and and the and the time has come for us to to reconfigure the way we think about ourselves in creative ways. And what I mean by that. To, it's this is a titanic task. Let me, and this is why. Like I teach sex and the Bible and queer studies in uh, at the seminary and um, my school, but I have in my school I see this all the time, and I see I saw that also at Vanderbilt and I saw that at PLTS and the UTU. The, when you ask a student, and I, I ask myself, how do you think yourself as a sexual being outside of the categories you have received? It's a really hard question to answer. And I think queer theory is suggesting that that's the task that we have ahead. Because for the, if not only for the reason that the, these categories that we use to define ourselves have two complications. The first one is that they were coined by the people who hated us. And second, they occlude the one what I see as one of the main contributions of queer theory, which is talking about sex, not sexuality. So I think the more we talk about sex, the more the less we're gonna talk about identities. So I'm not gonna predict the future, but I'm gonna say that a post-identitarian future is a future in which we talk about sex more. And we talk about sex in more complicated ways than the current theologies allow us to do. I think one of the contributions of weird theory, what I'm suggesting here is that sex is just not, it's not only a beautiful thing, it's also an ugly thing. And because it's ugly, it's also beautiful. And because it's ugly, it's also Christian. The what was the question about Jesus? It uh, let me I, the text. Uh, 
uh, was Jesus, would Jesus have been, maybe they're saying, against sexual orientation identities? Because of, because as you say, it interfered with perhaps the formation of Christian community or... Mm. So one of the contributions of Foucault, and I think um, it's worth remembering, is that, well, not only Foucault, but like queer historiography, is that in Jesus' time and the Greco-Roman time, there was no sexual identity, period. There were sexual acts, but not sexual identity. We have come, as I said before, so used to thinking about our sexual lives in terms of identity, that we cannot envision a past or a future in which those sexual identities don't exist. I do think if you ask, this is, I'm bringing here the personal believer, uh, because despite all the talk about sex, I'm also a Christian Catholic, I'm pretty orthodox at that. Um, I do think Jesus will be against any identity, period, that that's that occludes the negation of the ego, the negation of the self. I think there is a lot to be rescued from the Christian message about the denial of the self. This seems like a pre anti queer argument in the sense that I mean queer politics is all about acceptance of the self. <laughs> so. Here, uh, swimming against uh, like a very a strong tide, but I I do I do think that this uh, queer politics of uh, loving oneself, that accepting oneself, has been necessary for many reasons, but I think it has trapped us too much in the discourse of our enemies. Thank you, <clears throat> and thank you, Lewis, for serving as our 17th annual Johnny Boswell Lecture. Uh, wonderful talk. It will be posted, the uh, video recording, within a week on our website. And um, uh, folks, we uh, always appreciate your support, your presence. And let me share my, our development people have encouraged me to share my screen and share with you our uh, QR code. So if you um, would like to support us, just take a picture of that on your device and we appreciate any and all support or go to our website. Uh, and so once again, uh, thank you all for being here, especially Lewis. And uh, it's been a real privilege and a treat having you with us. Thank you so much. It has been an honor. You're welcome. Good, good day, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good night. Thank you for being here. Take care.